Hello, beloved saints and sons and daughters of the Almighty. Thank you so much for listening. Today we're doing <coughs> Torah portion Vayeki. And Vayeki means he and he lived. And what they're talking about is Jacob lived in Egypt with Joseph for 17 years before he died. <coughs> and so it comes, and this whole story comes with a great ending. Because, um, Jacob thought he, Joseph was dead. He thought he was dead, but he was alive. Just like we, uh, they thought Yeshua was dead, but he was alive. And so it's a whole, there's a lot of similarities uh, between Joseph and um, the Messiah. I'm just going to rattle them off real quick. Next time that you run into a Jewish brethren, <laughs> it's our job to bring them to the Messiah. And so this is a great way, really quickly. To bring them to the Messiah, okay? So, um, okay, so both um, the Messiah and Joseph were betrayed by their own brothers. Both were sold for silver. Both were put into the ground. Both lost their family, lost their job, lost their ministry and their priesthood. And both suffered extreme hardship. And both became the second most powerful leader. And both saved the whole world at that time. And both were thought to be dead, but were alive. So, uh, I mean, it's it's just, there's too many things that point to the Messiah. Isaiah 52, 53. Um, Daniel 9 points to the Messiah. And I have a whole video on it. I recommend that you watch it. It's uh, quite amazing. Um, praise Yahweh, all glory to Yahweh. Uh, but it, it it prophetically shows the Messiah. So, I mean, how long did that take? Uh, about uh, one minute. So here's another one, Daniel 9. So the summary, uh, based on Josephus' writings, who is a Jewish historian, um, King Darius Nothanus reigned about four, around 409 B.C. And this is when Haggai helped encourage the people to rebuild the temple, as we see in Haggai chapter 1, verse 15. So, in Daniel 9, it says that there will be 62 sets of seven, which is 434 years until the rebuilding of the temple, and to when the Messiah will be killed. So, if you minus 434 years from 409 B.C., when King Darius uh, Nathanus was reigning, you get 25 AD, which lands exactly on what most scholars agree when the Messiah died. He died in 25 AD, which is um, 25 AD. And if you take seven sets of seven, which is 49 years, you, um, which was the year Daniel prophesied the end of the war would become. This takes you to 74 A.D., and this is exactly 49 years um, from 25 A.D., which was the end of the Jewish-Roman War. The last battle was at Masada in southern Israel. Ultimately, the Romans won the war, and this was the end of the Roman-Jewish Wars. It was prophesied by Daniel. So the whole thing is prophesied in Daniel 9, and the reason why... Um, we know that the Messiah died before 30 A.D., which most people think. But most scholars, uh, all scholars agree that he died before that because King Herod died in 4 B.C. And he was the one that ordered all the children to be killed. So if he died in 4 B.C., then the Messiah had to be born before 4 B.C. So most scholars uh uh, agree that he was born around 8 BC, which would line up perfectly with him dying at 25 AD. So you can research it for yourself, but here we again we have Daniel's prophecy uh, coming true and pointing to the Messiah. I also have an amazing video that points to when the Almighty married Israel in the desert and how it points to Yeshua marrying uh, scattered Israel. Um, and reuniting um, Judah and Israel back together again. So remember that Yahweh is still married to Judah, and Israel is going to marry the Messiah. 
But I have a whole video on it, and I recommend you walk it. It's about the holy days, and it's quite interesting. But we need to talk to our Jewish brethren. We need to bring them on board. We need to plant seeds with them because we want them to be saved. Um, it's very important. It's very important. These are our brothers, and we need to care for them. They are the lost flock. And what I get with that is, it's kind of like Joseph. Joseph uh, was separated from his brothers, and nobody went and tried to get them. And and that's our, our job. Our job is to bring the... Judah is separated from the flock. They don't believe in the Messiah. And they're not going to be saved because of that reason. So we need it's our job to go get them. We're not going to be like the 11 brothers who didn't care that their brother was gone. They didn't care. They didn't ever go looking for him. So, you know, I encourage you to call the Chabads. Go visit the Chabads. Go visit your um, Jewish brethren, um, Reformed Jews, and the conservative Jews, and all the Jewish people, and just and the ones that are in the world. <laughs> you know, they, 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 need to, they need to know the truth. And so it's our job to bring them back. These are, this is our lost brother who's there in Egypt. And we need to bring them out of Egypt back into the promised land. So let's not be like the 11 brothers who didn't do anything and just, you know, you know, forgot about their brother. We don't want to forget about our Jewish brother. This is super important. This is one of the messages I got about out of this. The beautiful thing about this is um, it has a great ending. It has a great ending. After the brothers did this horrific thing, the Torah portion is one of the best because it, it's a great telling of restoration to the father and son. And um, he, Jacob got to spend the last 17 years of his life with Joseph. And how cool is that? And um, he was probably really disappointed in his uh, other 11 brothers for doing what they did and separating them from us. Uh, and um, Jacob realized it was partly his fault for showing favoritism, and I think that he repented of that, and that's why it's important that we don't show favoritism ever with people at work, at church, at anywhere. Everybody is equal. We're all the same. We should be treated equal as well, no matter what. This is, the other thing that this Torah portion teaches us is we should never take vengeance into our own hands. You know, or try to make our own authority. Uh, Judah should have never set to sell the brother. That's just uh, that's just hateful and mean. He did it so he could be the priest of the family, just like Jacob stole um, the priestly birthright um, from Esau, even though he was already going to get it. So did Judah steal? So. It runs in the family. These sins run in the family. So once you sin, that goes down the line. Um, and this one sin that that uh, <clears throat> that Isaac does, or that that uh, Jacob does, causes all kinds of snowball effects of sins, right? So he he tricks Esau out of his uh, priestly breath, uh, priestly birthright <laughs> with the soup. And then he steals his prophetic blessing, and um, that wasn't cool. And then, so so he is tricked by, by Laban, and he's in, tricked into marrying a woman he doesn't love. And so, um, and then, again, what happens is um, Esau catches up with him, and then he becomes the servant. He calls Esau master. So his prophetic blessing is reversed, and um, he actually becomes the servant to Esau, and he gives him all these flocks and herds and half his wealth, over $500,000. And then um, his, his sons deceive him, just like he deceived his father. And then Judah steals the priestly blessing here for birthright, just like he did. And because of that, Judah loses two sons. Just like he separated Jacob and Joseph, that's two people that grieved greatly. Well, he grieved greatly over his two sons. See, Yah is an almighty of justice. He doesn't let anyone get away with anything. 
That's what I see in this Sora portion. Whenever there's a sin, there is another punishment that comes with it. You can't get away with it. And then since the brothers sold Joseph into slavery, guess what? They were in slavery for 400 years and in the desert for another 400 years. So one stupid sin by Jacob causes a huge snowball effect that lasts 500 years of just chaos and bad stuff. So <laughs> don't sin because you're going to screw up your whole family line, your descendants down the line for a long way. It's just you can't sin. You just can't do it. You can't do it. Just don't do it. Uh, because it's going to ruin your whole family. And so why did Jacob ask Joseph to make a vow putting his hand on his thigh? Okay, this is kind of weird, right? But why would they put their hand on their thigh? And the answer to this is I believe that when someone would put their hand under their thigh, it represents life. The thigh represents life. And this is the area where life was generated and the thigh, I believe, also represents the circumcision covenant and the promise that there would be uh, many people, many children, a good land and a, and a promised land and, and good food. And this is a great promise because a lot of people don't realize, but before the flood, the land was cursed. Adam, uh, Yahweh cursed the land. And so it was hard to grow food from thorns and thistles and the sweat of his brow. It was really difficult to grow food. And then also Cain and all his descendants were cursed and they couldn't grow any food. So they couldn't eat any food at all. They couldn't grow food. They had to be servants to the farmer. And so they had to work on the land for somebody else in order to get food. So I think that land was very scarce, and this is why maybe evil was in their hearts continually. They were fighting over food. And so this promised land that we are walking in this promise, we, uh, uh, America is a breadbasket. This is part of the promise. It's a, it's a type and shadow of a promised land. It's very similar to Israel. Uh, Israel was set up by believers that followed Yahweh, and so was America. America has more Christians than any other nation in the world. This is the only reason why they're blessed and because of the promise to Abraham. So, uh, in a way, and to Ephraim and Manasseh, it, it, it all ties in here. So, we are, we are greatly blessed, not because of anything we've done, uh, but because we follow Yah and our descendants, I mean our ancestors, our ancestors were holy, Abraham. Only because of Abraham's righteousness and Isaac's righteousness and Jacob repenting and becoming righteous are we allowed these great blessings of great food and abundance. And so, uh, but anyway, let's get back to the thigh thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, being in the promise, uh, so Joseph had to drink this cup of affliction with the brothers. Also had to drink their cup of affliction for being in slavery for 400 years. It all points to this cup of the idolatrous woman that Yeshua has to drink and and he did this drink and but Yeshua's thigh did not rot okay so he wasn't guilty and so when the thigh rot when his thigh rot that means that she couldn't have children so she couldn't bring life to the earth so the thigh represents life and so when somebody uh, puts their hand on the thigh they're making a vow with Yahweh and the other person and they're vowing their life to complete this vow they're saying that I'm saying with my life that I will complete this if I um, you know with my life I will complete this vow my life on the line and Yahweh is a witness and so this is what the thigh represents it represents life and you're vowing your life What's really fascinating is this thigh represents life. You're making a vow with your life. The making the vow with this thigh represents the vowing with your life. <clears throat> this being um, buried in the promised land is symbolic of being in the kingdom and gaining eternal life. And so it's um, tied to the second covenant, which is uh, gaining eternal life through the promised land. Of eternal life right which is a better covenant and um, it's funny because we drink this symbolic cup 
of Yeshua's blood, and we eat his bread, which is the body, and uh, we enter in the second covenant during the Last Supper, and that that gives us not a physical land of promised land, but a spiritual promised land of eternal life. And so it's all tied in with this cup, this cup of affliction. And so, um, so drinking this cup of affliction. And and doing it without committing adultery and without uh, hating your brothers because you drink in this cup of affliction, but you actually love your brothers and you forgive them and you bless them and you don't commit idolatry even though you're in you're surrounded by idolat idolaters. Uh, Joseph was surrounded by all these Egyptian idolaters. He's in a terrible situation. His own assembly his own church betrayed him uh his own group of people who worship yahweh who were supposed to be the, the kindest people in the world were actually the worst people in the world <laughs> and the egyptians were treating him better and so he still didn't become he didn't become pagan so he drank a cup of affliction did, did not commit idolatry and still loved his brothers and so if you too will be drink, be uh, asked to drink this cup of affliction. And if you go through it with love towards others that have wronged you, and don't commit idolatry in any way, then you too will make it to the promised land of eternal life and fulfill the second covenant. And not only just fulfill the, the, the circumcision covenant, but you will fulfill the better, the second covenant. And make it to the promised land of eternal life. So, it's a, it's a royal cup. Um, so those believers who mature and they still go through this with love, with for Yah and others who go through this, will pass the test, and they'll get to drink of this royal silver cup forever. This is so awesome. This is so awesome. You know, it all ties in. And so uh, we want to, we're going to be called to drink this cup of affliction. We're going to be called and we're going to be put in a situation where idolatry is surrounding us all over. We're going to be put in a situation that we do not want to commit idolatry. And so um, we want to make sure that we keep this vow with our lives, just like we're grabbing onto the side of Abraham or Jacob and we are promising, yes, we will keep this covenant vow for, with our lives. We will never commit idolatry. We will always love Yahweh and we will always love others. And then we will get to drink of the royal cup forever. The silver royal cup forever with Yahweh and be part of his royal family. So it all kind of ties in together. And it's, uh, it's about being like Yeshua, who uh, also had to drink this bitter cup of affliction. His thigh did not rot. His thigh did not rot because he never committed idolatry. He never hated his brother. And so um, this, this, this cup is going to be given to us. Everyone's going to drink this cup of affliction. And how you handle this cup of affliction will determine your eternal outcome. So... Never commit idolatry and never and never give up your love for others in Yahweh ever. So just as Abraham's servant vowed on the thigh of Abraham to find a bride for Isaac, and just as Joseph vowed on the thigh of Jacob to bring him to the promised land, so was so us too, when we get baptized, we make a vow uh, that we will do our best to keep the commandments, not commit idolatry, so we can make it to the promised land, but also to bring idolatrous Israel out of idolatry and bring them, um, because they're on their way to getting the curse of the rotten thigh and dying. So it's our job to bring them back and make them the virgin bride so they too could be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb and get to marry the, the Messiah. Because right now they're looking like an adulterous bride 
with a rotting thigh, and the rotting thigh is represents death, and they're on their way to death. So just as Abraham's servant went out and found a bride, so are we to go out and find a bride. Just as Joseph brought Jacob to the promised land, so are we to bring others to the promised land. It is our job to bring the Jews and tell them about Mashiach. It is our job to bring the Buddhists, the atheists, the Muslims to the truth so they can too get eternal life. It's our job to get the lukewarm Christians to stop keeping Sunday. Stop doing Easter, which is, is a fertility god, Ishtar. Stop doing Halloween, which is Satan's birthday. And Sunday is sun god worship. Get them out of that so they don't get the rotten thigh. And that leads to death. So, um, but, um, so it's our job to plant seeds with these people and let Yahweh do the rest. You know, we just plant seeds. Some plant seeds, some water, but Yahweh gives the increase. And just pray that Yahweh gives the increase with these people. I was I was going through this Torah portion. I noticed, you know, there's this symbolism with sin and clothes. So I'm just gonna read the different levels of sin and how it's symbolic of having clothes or not having clothes. And so the first level of sin is the worst level of sin. This is when a person who has sinned is completely unclothed. <laughs> Adam and Eve sinned in Yahweh's throne area, and this was such a bad sin because they were in the presence of Yahweh. He can't be around sin. So they lost their eternal bodies. They were clothed with a heavenly light, a heavenly love. They didn't even know what sin was. They had no idea what evil was. They were perfect beings. And so they lost this, and uh, they knew they were naked. And so this was a terrible sin. And also this happened at Gethsemane, um, when the Pharisees had Yeshua arrested. There was a man there who uh, was wearing all white linen, and his uh, robe fell off, and he ran away without his clothes on. And this was symbolic of the great sin that was committed. So this is the worst a sin you can do is to be completely unclothed, scripturally speaking. The next level is when someone has sinned bad, so that his uh, garments are torn. If he, usually they'll tear their own garments in grief, and it's symbolic of a bad sin. And um, it's not as bad as being naked, but it's almost there. It's almost the same thing. It's the involves involves um, you know a terrible sin, and so. Um, you know the Pharisees tore the, the the high priest tore his garments, and when Yeshua said, "Are you?" they asked him, "Are you the son of of Yahweh?" and he said, "Yes, I am." And so they tore their garments and said, "Blasphemy!" And so this was a great sin by the 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 high priest because number one, they didn't believe Yeshua, uh, and number two. They were going to put him to death. So this was a huge sin. So he, his tar garments were torn. And number three is, it is commanded that no high priest is allowed to tear his garments. So he didn't. This showed that he didn't know the law. He didn't know the commandments. He know if he didn't even know that you're not allowed to tear your garments, then he sinned triple, tr three times there. So that was a big sin. And so. Um, we all we're, we're all gonna make sins, and so when we when we do a really bad sin, and um, let's say that you're completely naked, you did a bad sin. Well, then you need to humble yourself with much fasting, with sackcloth, with confessions to Yahweh, asking forgiveness and repentance, weeping and crying to Yahweh for your mistake, and He will forgive you. Okay, so this is okay. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, so you can be forgiven. No matter what sin you have done, nothing can separate you from the love of Yahweh. So, if you've torn your garments, if you've done a sin like this, this is another thing you can do. It's also with much fasting. Put on sackcloth. You can buy it at Walmart. It's like six bucks. You get a brand new bag of sackcloth. Put ashes on your face. Make confessions. Ask forgiveness. And repent. Come with a plan not to do it anymore. And you're going to be forgiven. So, I mean, Yod doesn't, he's not looking for perfection. He's looking for repentance. He's looking for improvement. He's looking for growth, right? Let's repeat that. 
He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for you to get better every year, right? Every year you're walking up Jacob's ladder, becoming less and less sinful, becoming better. He wants to see improvement. And if there's improvement, he is happy. No one is ever going to be perfect. There's only one perfect, and that's Yahweh and Yeshua. Well, both of them are perfect, right? So, um, but he wants to see improvement, okay? So let's improve. All right, the next level of sin is having clothes stained. When you stain your clothes, this represents a lesser sin, and you can do the same thing with the confessions and, you know, cleansing yourself, bathing, um, doing a mikvah. Uh, which is just taking a shower or, or a bath. And um, the next level of sin is um, having your clothes on but with no stains. So then you're, you're actually walking good. You're good. You're not perfect, all right? But you're, you're, you're not walking in sin. You're keeping the commandments, right? So this is, this is a great place to be. This is a great place to be. Many people are doing this when they're keeping the commandments in their clothes. They're, they're not torn. They're not stained. Or if they do stain it, it's like a tiny stain and they clean it off real quick. And so that happens for most people, right? And the next level of keeping the commandments is wearing all white linen, okay? Now this in Revelation says it's the righteous deeds of the saints will keep you clothed in white linen. Those who are martyred and never denied Yahweh's commandments, and Yahweh's keeping of the uh, the uh, and, and never denied Yahweh and keeping of the Sabbath on Saturday, and they were killed, and they never denied Yahweh even unto death, will be clothed in white linen. So the white linen represents a priest. Priests wear white linen, but it also represents the bride. The priests are the bride as well. So we are called to be priests. We are called to be bride. And what did the priests do? They did full-time service, evangelizing, discipling, teaching, preaching. They did full-time ministry. So this is how you can qualify yourself as a bride and a priest in the kingdom and clothe yourself in white. They also help the less fortunate, the widows, the orphans, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned. Doing righteous deeds of the saints keeps you in white linen. So you need to be doing some kind of ministry of helping the less fortunate. You see, we're strong. And the strong are supposed to take care of the weak, okay? Until you become weak yourself, you should be helping the less fortunate. That means the little children, you should be helping them. The elderly, you need to be helping them. The ones who don't know Torah, you need to be teaching them Torah. So those are the weak of the world. And we see that in Romans 14, I mean 15. Romans 15, we are commanded to help the weak of the world. Um, it's the first verse in chapter 15 of Romans. So it's not optional. We don't, it's not optional that we don't spread the gospel. It's not optional that we don't help the elderly. It's not optional that we don't help the poor. We don't. It's not optional that we don't help the poor. In fact, it's a sin. If you know to do good and you don't, it's a sin. So we have to. The strong need to take care of the weak. This is what King David did. He had these weak sheep. A lion comes. And what does David do? He doesn't run away and save his own life. No, he risks his own life. He goes out there and tries to save and kills this lion. He protected his flock and took care of the weak. And so that's our job is to go out there and fight the lions of the world and, and protect the weak. There are, are um, killing 50 million babies and, and nobody does anything. It's a, it's a horrific genocide. It's a hate crime uh, because the number one cause of death for African Americans and Hispanics is abortion. So, and the, the founder of Planned Parenthood was well notorious, well known, well, or notorious racist, Margaret Sanger. Look it up for yourself. So, the whole thing, and they put Planned Parenthood in ethnic neighborhoods. 70 to 80 percent of all Planned Parenthoods are in ethnic neighborhoods or very close to ethnic neighborhoods. And so they have an agenda. They have an agenda and they're trying. And so Hispanic lives matter. I didn't, uh, Black lives matter should be out in front of these abortion clinics. More people die of abortion than um, any other way. So this is, you know, this is something 
if they really cared about black people, they they would be out there praying for them. It's super important. But anyways, we need to take care of the weak and the, and the innocent. Y'all hate the shedding of innocent blood. And so we just can't stand by and do nothing. So we have to do things. Okay, and that's how we get clothes in white linen. And that's the best level, right? We don't want to be um, the best level. We want to be clothed in white linen. Not just clothes, but white linen. We don't want any stains. We don't want any rips. And we definitely don't want to be uh, naked. Okay. The next question I have is, why did Jacob want to be buried in the promised land so badly? I kind of answered that earlier. But the main reason is if you... You have the honor of being buried in the promised land. It is a great uh, honor and symbolically points to making it to the spiritual promised land of eternal life. It means that you have arrived as a believer, living the blameless life, not perfect, but continually growing and being better and less sinful. So this land is holy. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand, but this land is holy. It is holy ground. It is the only holy land in the whole world. This dirt is, this is where they made Adam and Eve. Adam is made from this holy land. And so Adam was holy. And so, um, so we are holy too. We are, um, you know, so, so we want to be buried there. We want to be, we don't want to be buried in just common land. We want to be buried in the holy land. If you're a holy person, you're going to be, so, uh, this is, this is where, we need to qualify to be buried there. And it's symbolic of making it to the promised land of eternal life. So, um, yes, I want to be uh, buried next to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, well, hopefully I'll be transformed when the Messiah returns. And uh, it'll be a quick transfer. And I, it, that would be the best scenario. But Yah's in control of everything. So he's the boss. But um, he decides... Uh, Y'all willing, we all make it to the promised land and, and we all are part of his kingdom. It would be such a great honor. The reason is um, Deuteronomy 11, 12 says, It is a land Yah, your Elohim, cares for. The eyes of Yahweh, your Elohim, are always on it from the beginning to the end of the year. So Yah, this is where Yahweh dwells. He's never seen out of the Holy Land. He's a holy a Kodesh Elohim. So that uh, means that he doesn't, he's never seen out of the Holy Land. Now he's spoken to people from the clouds, um, but he's never walked on anywhere in Scripture, out of anywhere in, uh, other than in the Holy Land. Um, that. Okay, so Rachel, who had some idols, but she buried them in Shechem, and it looked like Jacob was really um, helping her leave idolatry that Laban had taught her, and she became holy, and she became so holy, she was actually buried in Bethlehem, which is a beautiful place, she's in the promised land, so I believe she symbolically made it into the promised land, so why was she buried in Bethlehem, and the key to the answer <laughs> is Bethlehem means house of bread, right? And who were her descendants? It was Joseph and Benjamin. But and um, really, the blessings went to Ephraim and Manasseh, as we see. Um, they bypassed Joseph in a way and are given to Ephraim and Manasseh. And Joseph's descendants, Ephraim and Manasseh, will be the bread producers of the world and bless the whole world with food, just as Joseph feeds the whole known world with bread here, we see in this Torah portion, uh, everyone is starving and Joseph is the Savior and he's feeding them. Um, and so America is called the bread basket and we help feed the whole world. And America is Ephraim, uh, based on scripture. And um, um, Manasseh is the United Kingdom. And between those two countries, we donate and help financially. Um, we give out billions of dollars in financial aid to help uh, countries that are starving or having problems. And we have so for many years. And it's not because 
of anything that we've done, but only because of this promise of Ephraim and Manasseh, and also um, the promise to Abraham that they would be uh, live in a land flowing with milk and honey, and they would bless the rest of the world. And so many people come to America to have a better life, and in the process they become Christian. And this is Yahweh's whole plan. He wanted to do this with Israel. He wanted to bless Israel with the 12 sons. And he wanted them to get rid of all the pagans. And so it would just be believers there that believed in Yahweh. And they would be blessed so immensely all the other nations would come to Israel and want to live there and become believers. And so they kind of failed at kicking out the, um, the believers. So America is a type and shadow of Israel. There are more Christians in America than any other country. It's not coincidence. And America helps out uh, thousands, hundreds of countries. <laughs> um, you know, and so, um, and people come to America uh, to get a better life and then to become believers. So it's, it's working. It's working. And so uh, America and Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh are come from this house of bread they are the bread basket and it, it, it's a good thing it's a it's an amazing thing because we 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 are so blessed that Yahweh took away the curse on the land when when Noah that was part of when Noah made it um, uh, to the when he went through the water on the ark for almost a year uh, Yahweh took away the curse as we see I think it's in Noah 6 I mean Genesis 6 <laughs> sorry um, he took away. The, I'll, I'll get the verse right here. So. Genesis 8:21, and Yahweh says, "And Yahuwah smelled a sweet savor, and Yahuwah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake.' So praise Yah that we do have abundant food and bread, and it's all because of this great blessing, I think, um, that was given. It was a promise to Abraham of a good food and good land. And America is a good land and good food. And praise Yahweh. Um, symbolically, it, it kind of points to Yeshua. Even though Yeshua is from the line of, uh, of Judah, of course. But he comes from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Of, and So it prophetically points to the bread of life, which is Yeshua. And the whole world is going to be saved. Um... Whoever eats of him at the Last Supper ceremony, uh, which is he is the bread of life, will enter the second covenant, which points to the promised land of eternal life. So John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Praise Yah. And um, why did Jacob... Bless Ephraim and Manasseh and not Joseph or his other son. And this inheritance is coming uh, to Ephraim and uh, not to Joseph. And why did he bless Ephraim over Manasseh, greater than Manasseh? And the answer is <laughs> that Yah knows the beginning from the end. So Yah blesses who he knows will do well and do what he plans them to do. So he knows who to bless, and he uses um, Jacob, who is a prophet, to bless who he's going to bless. So he speaks through Jacob. So the reason why he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh is if um, they were his own children was because Reuben and all the other brothers had sinned so greatly against Joseph. Uh, Joseph was already blessed. Benjamin um, blessed as well. But um, um, Ephraim, he knew that Ephraim was going to be uh, better than Manasseh. I mean, not better, but I, I don't know the word to use here. They're both more very good. Ephraim and Manasseh are both good. But he, he tends to bless Ephraim more. Um, and the reason why is Yah has a plan, and he uses who he uses. And so he knows the person's heart uh, from the beginning, from the end. And so... That this is why I believe. So I believe that Yah has set aside incredible blessings for the other ten brothers, but because of their grievous sin, they lost 
these huge, incredible blessings. And so this is a lesson, lesson to us, not to be envious of anyone. Just don't sin, no matter what. And if you overcome, then Yah will bless you huge. Don't be like Joseph, who for, was forgiving and um, beautiful. Be like him, and you, you will be blessed. And so it's super important that we walk um, like Joseph. Joseph. Joseph is our example. And he's the younger son, and all throughout Scripture we see the younger son blessed uh, more than the older son. The firstborn uh, seems to fail, and the secondborn seems to succeed. So, um, Adam sinned, Yeshua was the secondborn, didn't sin. Esau was worldly and loved the world, but Jacob didn't. He loved the Scriptures and to become holy. Reuben, well... Jacob wasn't perfect, though, but he did seek out Yahweh and follow his ways and was called blameless. And then he became blameless again, even after he messed up. Reuben sinned. He was the oldest son, and Joseph did well. Um, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was older, uh, sinned and started their own religion with Jeroboam uh, having his own holy days, kind of like Christmas and Easter. He made up his own holy days on the eighth month. He made up his own altars, which Yahweh didn't command, and he picked his own priests. And it's the same thing today. Uh, Christians are picking Sunday. They're picking um, Easter and doing these holy days. They're, uh, you know, Yahweh commanded the holy days in Leviticus 23, and we don't work those days. And it's funny because Christmas, nobody works, or nobody's supposed to work, and it's just like they make up their own rules. It's a... It's a false holy day. It's not commanded anywhere in scripture. Um, but I'm not going to judge people because I used to do Christmas, so I'm not going to judge. But it's something we need to uh, pray about and walk away from. It has pagan origins. December 25th um, in Roman times was a week of lawlessness where you could commit more murder, adultery, do all kinds of heinous crimes and not be punished for a whole week. So it's tied to paganism. That's a horrible, horrible holiday. Anyways, Satan comes in. And I blame it on Satan only. All right. Um, the 12 brothers failed at spreading the, the gospel and getting rid of the pagans in the land. And the 12 apostles succeeded, the younger 12 apostles. So the firstborn, us, is the same thing. We were all born in the flesh. We are fleshly and sinful, but once we're baptized, we become a spirit man. The old man, the first man, died. The spirit man is alive. So yes, we are that second son. We are the spirit beings. We are going to be successful. We are going to succeed. You are a saint established by Yah. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1. You are joint heirs with Messiah. You are a holy one, a kodashim, a saint of the Most High. You are called Chosen and anointed to be one of God's chosen people. You're going to be part of God's royal family. You're going to have his name written on your forehead. You're going to get a new name with a white stone. You're going to get to walk on streets of gold and see a city of gold. And you're going to see Yahweh's beautiful face. You will have a calling. You are the second born. Do not neglect your calling. Do not let anyone steal your crown. This is your time. This is your calling right now. Don't let anyone steal that from you. Do not let anyone take that from you. Seriously. You are the second born. You are the su successful one. You are the blessed and anointed one. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Messiah abiding in you. you there's no excuse. We can overcome and be what we've been called to be. Okay. <laughs> Enough of that. I'm going to get back on... Um, Genesis, Genesis 48.10 No, the eyes of Israel were dim of age, so that he could not see uh, see well. So Joseph brought them near, and he kissed them and embraced them. So you see, his eyes were dim. Israel's eyes were dim. And it's just like Israel today. They're going Just as Israel was going blind in his old age, so will Israel, the nation, become blind at the end times. They will become blind to the Torah. And wind up breaking it and following this beast, this false messiah. I have uh, several videos on the beast. 
uh, who is the mark of the, what is the mark of the beast in Revelation. And I recommend you watch those videos um, to know what that is. I'm not going to get into it today, but this whole Torah portion of this famine, there were seven years of famine, there were seven years of plenty. It's it's prophetic picture of the end times. And we don't want to go to Egypt to get our food. We don't want to trust in a pagan nation to feed us. We need to trust in Yahweh. And Jacob should have trusted in Yahweh. His 11 brothers should have trusted in Yahweh. But um, Yah he had a plan. Yahweh had a plan for, um, uh, you know, this to come about. And so um, we don't want it. We want to trust in Yahweh to bring manna from heaven to bring water from a rock and uh, he will he'll bring food to us in a crow he'll make our flower pots filled every every day so we need to trust in him he's supernatural it is better to die of starvation to, than to take the mark of the beast because it says no one will be able to buy or sell without taking the mark and you're gonna have to watch the video i don't want to discuss it right now but it's i think you'll find it interesting Let's talk about Joseph here. This is interesting because why Joseph gets a blessing, and it's a very small. It's one verse. It's Genesis forty-eight twenty-two. And uh, why was Joseph's land in here? It's uh, the land of the Amorites. And the Amorites lived outside the promised land, on the other side, on the east side of the Jordan. So this is very interesting, and I think I have an answer for that. Um. Now, we all know that Joseph was buried in Shechem, which is in the promised land. And so, um, there's two takes on this. And I'm going to read the verse for you. Uh, Genesis 48, 22. I have given you to one portion above your brothers, which I took out of the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Okay, so this is this battle between the Amorites and Jacob is never spoken of in Scripture. I, I couldn't find it. And so, um, I'll have to look again, but um, the Amorites dwelt in, outside of the east of the Jordan. So he, he's giving them uh, a land outside of the promised land. But this word portion means Shechem. So some people believe, oh, this portion is Shechem. He's giving them Shechem. The word portion means Shechem, is the word Shechem, which um, means corner or shoulder. And so some people say, well, that he's giving them the land of Shechem, which could be true. And so that's just one theory. But here's the other theory. Uh, the Amorites dwelt on the east side of the Jordan, so he's giving them the east side. Uh, he's giving them this land outside of the promised land. And it's symbolic of, of Joseph. He, I believe that he should have left after the seven years of famine. He should have went back to Israel, and he should not have stayed in Egypt. He fulfilled his, his duty of saving the Israelites, but he should have moved back. But I believe that he loved his power, he loved his status, he could have loved his wealth that he had, he loved his position, and he liked it. And so here he is keeping them in a pagan nation, which is not good because that's a bad influence, number one. And he's keeping them around customs and traditions that are not holy. And so this is not good. He should have left and he could have, you know, escaped or left or, you know, he could have done anything. He said he said he could have, you know, there's, he had power, so he could have escaped. There's ways of him escaping. And um, he should have. And this is probably why he was um, given this blessing of being bar buried outside the promised land. But this is just a theory. But it's really um, it's symbolic of us, right? Um, let's say um, you're given a job for a season where you're making $200,000 a year. And um, you're doing quite well. And you're able to bless you know, your congregation and your family and other people and just things are going really well for you and you're really being able to to help people in a bad situation. So this is a good thing, right? But Yah maybe doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to go back out of there and do ministry and do be the pastor, do be the preacher and, and 
do full-time ministry and not be in this worldly job forever. He might put you there for a season so that you can help save some people financially. Um, so we got to remember that no matter what position we're in, we can't stay in the world. Anyone who's friends with the world is an enemy to Yah, right? And I'm not saying you can't have a job and make a ton of money, and, 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 and but if that's taking over your life and cutting into your ministry time and cutting into your advancing Yah's kingdom, then you might want to pray about that, okay? Because we don't want to be like Lot. Lot was extremely wealthy. He was uh, like a king in his own right. And, uh, you know, he was just a lowly shepherd when he was out there, which is quite humbling. Um, but there, there's people that, uh, you know, he was treated like royalty in Sodom and Gomorrah, and his wife loved that. Um, and so they were treated like kings. And um, it got to his head, and he liked it there. They liked it there, but that was not what Yahweh wants. He wants us to be the lowly shepherd. He wants us not to be a high scout. He he wants us to do the kingdom work and kingdom things, whatever you know that entails. You know, if he sends you uh, to uh, another country, and uh, you know you're you're feeding uh, animals, you're feeding the sheep in another country, and, you, and then you need to do that. That's what y'all calls you to do. Okay, if he wants you to be a shepherd, you be a shepherd. But he mainly wants you to be a shepherd of people. That's our job. That's what we've been trained to do for thousands and thousands of years. All the Israelites were shepherds. So we have it in bread. And what does a shepherd do? It protects the flock. It risks their life to save a flock. It feeds the flock. We're supposed to feed the, the flock. We're supposed to water the flock with the Holy Spirit by doing holy things. And feeding the flock the word. We're, you know, and... Um, when they're hurt, mend into their hurt leg, you know? So this is what we're supposed to do. That's our main calling in this life, not not to be of the world. So I believe that Joseph should have left, and this is why he got this blessing outside the promised land. Do we have guardian angels? Is this just some kind of a story? And the answer to that is, yes, we do have guardian angels, if you're keeping Torah. So, um, Abraham had an angel that protected him, as we see in Genesis 48:16. In my Elohim, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the Elohim, who has been my shepherd all my life, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm. Boom! He has redeemed Abraham from all harm. Okay, this is good. So if you're keeping the commandments, you have a guardian angel. Genesis 24, an angel was going to be sent before the servant to help facilitate a wife for Isaac. Boom, another guardian angel helping out. Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits to serve those who will inherit salvation? So those who are keeping the commandments will inherit salvation. So they're here to serve us. And protect us. And how awesome is that? That we have guardian angels. Uh, Acts 12. Uh, when she recognized uh, Peter's voice. She was so overjoyed. She ran back without opening it. And exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind. They said. They told her. When she kept insisting that it was so. They said it must be his angel. So this is very interesting. They knew that. Uh, believers had angels, and they might look like us as well. This is fascinating and very uh, twilight zony <laughs> and trippy. So, if they look like us, <laughs> did they live like a similar life on another planet or on Earth in, in a similar time period kind of thing? I don't even want to go there. It's like making my brain uh, overthink. I think. But anyways, the angel looked like him. Just think about that for a moment. That's that's very, very, uh, you could do a whole, you know, uh, fictional story just on that verse alone. But I'm not going to go there because uh, we don't know for sure about that. Anyway, I, I, that's interesting. But again, we see 
uh, angels are there for protecting of the saints. And we are saints. All of us are saints. Uh, Hebrews 13.2, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So, um, angels look exactly like humans. They don't have wings, by the way, um, and they can fly, though, but they don't have wings. They can disappear. They can make fire come out of uh, and start fires uh, out of nowhere. Um, they have... Um, Supernatural abilities, they can be invisible as well. Um, so be careful who, what you say and how you talk to people because angels report back to Yahweh. And so there are, we have guardian angels, which is really cool. And then we have, watch, uh, we have watcher angels, I believe. And so we got to be on our best behavior all the time, no matter what. Um, because you may think you're talking to a person. But it's an angel that reports directly to Yahweh. And so, be good, be good, be good. All right. What is the difference between the priestly birthright and the firstborn blessing? Well, the priestly birthright, obviously, is the line of Melchizedek being the priest of the family. The firstborn blessing is two things. It's a prophetic blessing over the descendants of your children. And it's a double portion of the inheritance so you would get normally you would get double what any of the other children would get because you're the firstborn so being the firstborn is a blessing but it seems like all the secondborns were the ones who were spiritually blessed and we are secondborn in the spirit so we are going to be blessed and we need to walk in that calling actually really good um, I just forgot to mention this when I was talking about the blessing. Why did Ephraim, um, why did Jacob bless Ephraim over Manasseh when Manasseh was the older brother? Well, the reason why is Yahweh knows the beginning from the end. He knows who the holy brother is going to be, and the younger one was going to be more holy. And so, um, Jacob is a prophet. He does whatever Yahweh, he's going to speak the words of whatever Yahweh puts in his mouth. Okay, and so when he speaks this blessing over the younger Ephraim, when he's supposed to be blessing the older uh, Manasseh more, he finally realizes that he didn't have to steal the blessing from Esau, because Isaac would have blessed Jacob more than Esau because Esau didn't deserve it. He wouldn't have gotten it. So right here, Jacob realizes how foolish he was to do that sin. To steal the blessing when he was going to get it anyways. Yahweh was going to bless him anyways. So this I thought was really ironic. And it just points to. Um, it just points to not trying to do everything our own way. Just be holy. Be righteous. Don't sin. It's okay to get frustrated. Everybody gets frustrated. Um, but just don't sin. Okay. Just don't sin. And. Just trust in Yahweh, and he, he, will, he will take care of you. I point this out uh, to most people don't realize this, but Numbers 13, 13 says, For all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal, they are to be mine. So every firstborn male is consecrated to Yahweh. In Luke 2, 23, we see this. And so... If you're the firstborn male of your family, and the only male keeping the Torah, the Sabbath on Saturday, and doing the holy days, then you're the priest of the family. It's your job to fulfill that duty and be the priest and preach, teach, disciple. If you're not doing that, then you're sinning. If you're not studying the Torah and becoming a student um, and, and teaching others, then you're not fulfilling this command, and this is the sin. So we want to... We are called to be priests and kings, as it says in Revelation 1 Peter 2, 9. We are a holy priesthood, a holy nation. So we need to walk in our calling. Okay, I'm just going to give you a theory based on Dr. Stephen Pigeon and Herbert W. Armstrong and other, um, other scholars. And it's based on archaeological and historical evidence and scriptural evidence. 
And so it's a theory. And so I just want to say um, that um, it's important that we just remember that we don't know exactly where all the tribes went, the 12 tribes, but most of them went to Europe based on historical evidence. So the, tri the, 12, the, 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 the 12 tribes of Israel all basically went to Europe, North Africa, um, and they also came to America, South America, um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, um, and most Western nations. And so this is where they are, they're, but they're scattered through the whole world. Um, Isaiah 11 says they've been scattered through the four corners of the earth. So I believe that most Israelites, most people on the face of the earth today have some Israelite blood. According to the promise given to Jacob and Isaac, that their descendants will fill the whole earth. Okay, and they'll be like sand of the sea. So there's seven billion people. So, anyways, but I'm just gonna give you um, some theories out there. So Reuben, they say, is France. Um, Simeon, they say, is um, mixed. Simeon and Levi are sc scattered through all of Israel. So this is interesting. Uh, because Levi, that means is scattered through these nations that I just mentioned. And if you uh, have a knack for cooking or barbecuing in particular, you like that. And uh, you like skinning your own meat. <laughs> and you might, and if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a judge, judge or a pastor, preacher, uh, you're in ministry of some sort, you're a musician or you love music, then you might be a Levite, because that's exactly what the Levites did. So that, that's in your blood. Um, it's just a theory I have. I, I find it interesting. Okay, with Judah, we have a lot of evidence on Judah, which is really cool. But there's the Mizrahi Jews that are in North Africa. The Sephardic Jews are in Spain. They moved, migrated mainly to Spain. And he, the Hebrew Peninsula is the Iberian Peninsula. In Iberian, if you see Iberian Peninsula in English, is the Hebrew Peninsula. So Spain is actually the Hebrew Peninsula. And in the 1600s, they were persecuted, and they moved, guess where? They moved to Mexico, South America, Brazil, Central America, and um, southeastern United States. And they intermarried with the Indians. The Cherokee Indians are very, they have a high Jewish markings for, if you're Cherokee Indian, you have Jewish blood, most likely. Uh, the Mexicans and all the, the Brazilians, uh, high Jewish markings on their DNA tests. Um, and then the, the Ashkenazi Jews uh, went to France. They went to um, uh, Ukraine almost 38% of all Ukrainians are Jewish. It's just in Russia. And so um, we have them spread also to India and Yemen. Ethiopia are the, and Iraq are the Mizrahi Jews. And so um, it's quite fascinating, actually. It's quite fascinating. But we have most evidence on the Jewish uh, um, migration. Now, Dan is... Um, they uh, they named London. They attacked London, the land of Lud, and uh, changed it to London, Luddan. And so London is uh, was a capital of Dan, or they over overtook London, and uh, it was their territory for a while. Denmark is named after Dan. Sweden is named after Dan. Ireland is uh, also another territory of Dan. Um, but they're all, you know, it's not called the United Kingdom uh, by coincidence. It's united with a bunch of Israelite tribes. And so uh, Naphtali, they say, is Norway, the Philippines, which is interesting, and Hawaii even. I found that fascinating. Uh, Switzerland is Greece, and Rome and Hungary is Gad. That's Gad. Switzerland, Greece, Rome and Hungary. Asher, they say, is Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, Ishakar is Finland. Uh, now, these are all just theories now, okay, based based on some facts and scriptural things. Zebulun is Holland and South Africa, Japan. Um, this is interesting. Indonesia. 
Uh, Manasseh is the British Commonwealth, United Kingdom, of course. Um, Ephraim in the United States. Benjamin is the Normans, Iceland, Quebec, uh, the Vikings. So um, the Normans uh, actually were in northern France and Ireland. So um, they were uh, very uh, fierce, fierce warriors, the Normans. And they were traced back to the tribe of Benjamin. <coughs> now, it's theory based on historical and logical, uh, logical, uh, archaeological evidence. And so, um, I don't know, it's fun. It's I'm not going to say it's 100% accurate at all. I'm just saying this is a fun theory. I think there's some big truth in there, especially with the tribes, the Jewish tribes. Um, they've traced that back, and uh, there's all kinds of evidence for that. But uh, it's just fun to check it out and, and to study this stuff out. It, and it doesn't matter because we're all grafted in anyway, and I believe everybody has some Israelite blood in them anyway. So uh, some uh, you might be talking to somebody who might be from some faraway country that's not even mentioned here. It might be a descendant a brother or sister of Yeshua. So, it doesn't matter. We are all grafted in if we're not. You know, we don't know for sure. if Even if we're from these countries, if we even have any Israelite blood or not. But we're all grafted in Israel. And that's the main point. We become a new spirit man. The old fleshly man is dead. We are spirit man. The Messiah is abiding in us. We stay attached to the vine by doing holy things. And, and always being holy. Acting like a priest helping the weak, doing good, and having big faith, being humble all the time, and um, doing what we're called to do. And this will help us stay attached to the vine and be part of spiritual Israel. Yah doesn't care about your, his, your nationality. He cares about your heart. Do you have love in your heart for other people? Do you, do you um, get angry but let it go right away and, 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 and not sin? Okay, everybody gets angry. We're all we all we all have emotions, but if you let it go and you forgive, that's what that's what's beautiful, and that's what Joseph did. He forgave and blessed those who hurt him, and we need to learn how to do that. And this will keep you as spiritual Israel. Uh, interesting correlation here with Manasseh in the United States. Yah is using the same pattern. I'm sorry, not with Manasseh, with Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim and the United States <clears throat> used the same pattern with the Levites. Just as there were 13 cities to dwell in, and he added 35 more with the Levites, totaling 48 states. So, so did uh, the tribe of Ephraim start with 13 states and then added 35 and became 48 states. And so, um, uh, I thought it was interesting. There are 46 presidents of the United States. There have been 46 kings of Judah and Israel. If you count Absalom, Adonijah, and Ishbosheth, a lot of people forget that Ishbosheth was a, a king of Israel at the same time King David was the king of Judah. Uh, they forget that after King Saul died, Ishbosheth was a king. Adonijah was crowned king, and so was Absalom. So um, they were kings, but only for a short period, of course. But that's 46 kings. And it says that um, um, Ephraim will be a multitude of nations, and that we're called the melting pot. And so this is why um, America gives billions of dollars to humanitarian aid more than any other country. We are the lender and not the borrower. Um, so, um, you know, this, there's a lot of prophetic blessings to point to this. Um, okay, so I just wanted to thank you so much for listening. And I hope this inspires you to push yourself to be more holy, to be more forgiving, to be kind to the unkind, to um, bless those who hate you. And give them water and food. <laughs> and um, forgive them. And also, you know, be like Joseph. And um, So, 
let's try this this let's try this week to think about how we can be the best version of ourselves right we are called to be saints i think it's important that we call all, uh, all the people in our congregation saints um it's important because words are powerful saint is the word in in hebrew which means kodesh means set apart to yahweh and so we want to be set apart to Yahweh because the ones who are set apart to Yahweh are going to be in the kingdom, in Yah's royal family. And we that's where Yah wants us. He wants us to be part of his royal family. And so we need to speak life and speak blessings and call each other saints and be the best be act like a saint today. This whole week. Do saintly things. Be the best version of yourself this week. Be kind, be loving, be generous. Uh, just do everything that a saint would do. Be the Mother Teresa. Be the the one who who stands out with love. Take the higher road. Take the higher road this week. All right. Um, be like Joseph. Be like Joseph. All right. Thank you so much. And may y'all bless you and pour his mighty Holy Spirit upon you mightily so you can call and be the holy vessel you've called and called to be. Amen.